Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that, that, that you are a living, loving God. Lord, there's so many people who, uh, who have founders of their religion that are dead and gone. They've decomposed in the grave, but we have a king who conquered the grave, who defeated death and overwhelmed um, sin and hell. And you offer us new life. We're so thankful for that, Lord. And so we raise a hallelujah tonight. We praise you. We, we declare that we love you and we want our hearts to be full of faith. We want to be fearless. We want to be courageous. And we want to do what you say because we know that your ways are the best ways. And so in our crazy chaotic culture that we're living in right now, would you show us the way back home, the way forward to peace and blessing and prosperity, not just for us to enjoy, but so that we can give a, a, a hope and a future to our children and our grandchildren and all people who, who come to this country uh, and so that we can be a blessing to other countries. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been talking about this amazing monument that is uh, actually called the, the uh, National Monument to the Forefathers. It was built by a grateful people in the state of Massachusetts to honor the suffering and the sacrifices of those who fought for liberty, freedom. And it says here both internal liberty, which is religious liberty, and external liberty so that they would have a political system that allowed them to be free and not under the, the boot of a tyrant. And so they, they gave us this secret sauce recipe for freedom and for liberty and, and justice. And it was very specific. In fact, I made a whole documentary movie about this called Monumental. We talked about that a couple of days ago. And this, this incredible strategy begins with faith. If you want a nation that's going to last and be free, our forefathers said that you must start with faith. And we talked about how it's a, it's a faith in the one true God of the Bible. Uh, faith is holding the word of God in her hand. And her foot is on a rock, which is Plymouth Rock. Faith is central. Faith is the very, very core of this entire strategy to produce liberty. And now tonight we're going to talk about the first manifestation of this faith of our pilgrim forefathers and foremothers. And that would be right here. And it is morality. Now I'm going to bring morality a little bit closer to you so that you can see her up close. But morality is here. And this is a woman who is, uh, if you notice, she has her eyes closed uh, because morality is an internal quality. She's holding the Ten Commandments in her left hand and she's holding the scroll of Revelation in her right hand, representing both the Old and the New Testament. Now, why would they point to morality as such an important part of uh, uh, having a, a nation that would be free? Well. I want to read to you from some of our founding fathers on the importance of morality. So listen to what George Washington said. George Washington, the very first president of the United States, said this. And uh, I'm reading here out of the American Covenant, the untold story. George Washington said, of all the things that lead to political prosperity, that is blessing, true religion, faith, and morality are indispensable supports and our duty is to respect and to cherish them. So the two indispensable supports, it's like my two legs are my two indispensable supports. If I stand up and you take my legs out from under me, I'm coming crashing down. And if we have a nation that is going to be free, George Washington said, you must have true faith, true religion, they called it, and you must have morality. And morality is an expression of that faith. Listen here to what, uh, uh, this is now uh, John Adams. He was a founding father and the second president of the United States says, it is faith and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. There it is again. 
those supports so that you can stand. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. If you want to be free, you must have virtue. You must have religion. Why is that? I'm going to connect the dots for you here in just a second. But first, listen to what founding father Benjamin Rush said. The only foundation for a republic is to be laid in true religion. That's faith. There she is. Without this, there can be no morality. There she is. He called that virtue. And without virtue, there can be no liberty. Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Are you hearing a theme? Are you seeing a pattern? Listen to John Adams again. He said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So why would he say that morality and faith are indispensable supports and that the government we have in this free, free society with the Constitution is inadequate for any other kind of a people than a people full of faith and full of virtue. Here's why. If you wanna control a bunch of people, you come down hard with an iron fist. You get out the long arm of the law with lots of force and you can make them behave. But if you want the people to be free, and that's what we're looking for. That's what all people of all civilizations have, have yearned for all throughout the ages. Liberty, liberty, freedom. What's necessary is they must learn to govern themselves. If they don't, you have rioting, you have lawlessness, you have theft, you have deceit, you have murder, you have greed and lust for power. And societies like that don't thrive. And so you need to bring them under control. If you want to have self-control so that you can have liberty, you must have a moral code that you follow. And that moral code must be the kind of moral code that brings blessing to everyone. See, you, you don't want Hitler's moral code, right? I mean, he, he had a moral code that worked for him, but didn't work out for other groups of people. You don't want Genghis Khan's moral code. He could control people but he didn't have a moral code that set people free, free to love, free to worship God, free to educate their kids, free uh, to have a political system where they could elect their own representatives and create their own laws. The only moral code that allows us to flourish as human beings and to be free is God's moral code, the most moral being in the universe. And where do we find that moral code? We find it in the book, in faith's hand, the Bible. You see, this idea of faith and morality being absolutely essential was not just some strategy and idea that the founders cooked up. No, this is the strategy of the ages ordained by God. The Ten Commandments in morality's hand Go all the way back to Moses and the Shema in Deuteronomy. You find this famous passage where, where Moses is telling the Jewish people before they go into the promised land to take these, to, to love the Lord with all of their heart and to take his commands and to write them on their heart and obey those commands themselves and then teach those commands to their children and teach them to them <clears throat> by speaking about them when they get up in the morning, when they walk along the road, when they sit down and when they lie down to go to bed. In other words, all day long, all throughout the day, teach them the commands of God. And that beautiful moral code of the Ten Commandments has been the guiding moral code and foundation for civilization for the last 3,000 years. 3,000 years. It wasn't the, the code of Hammurabi. It wasn't the moral code of uh, a Chinese emperor. It was the moral code of God found in his word, the Ten Commandments. And that moral code serves as a mirror. It shows us our sin and our need for a savior. That moral code is, is, is like a curb that keeps us from going off the rails and crashing and burning by committing adultery, by li living a life of, of lying and, and deception or greed or ungratefulness, failing to honor God. And it's also a guide. It points us to the source of our blessing 
and our protection. When God says, don't do something, he's saying, don't hurt yourself. Don't lie, that's gonna lead to suffering. Don't commit adultery, that's gonna destroy your family and injure your children and your spouse. When he says do something, he's saying help yourself to blessing. This moral code found here is indispensable. And this moral code is not something that is forced upon anybody. In order for this to work, remember, two moralities left under the chair she's sitting on is the evangelist. I don't know if you can see this, but you've got evangelist there. And the evangelist is preaching the gospel because again, they believe that true morality began with an internal change of the heart. The Bible says that there is none good, not even one. The only one who is truly good is God because God's standards of goodness are perfection. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a perfect person. I've fallen short. And so my heart must be changed in order for me to want to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. And when we come to him in faith and we put our faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ, God, he, he takes out our heart of stone, the Bible says, and this illust a heart of stone that is cold and unresponsive and gives us a heart of flesh. He puts a new spirit within us and gives us new desires. Once that internal change happens, we now are receptive to the kind of moral code that brings blessing. And we want to love our neighbor and even consider them more valuable than ourselves. That's where true morality begins. Transformation of the human heart by the Spirit of God. And then that external standard of morality is written in, in black and white in the Ten Commandments and throughout the New Testament, and we see Jesus using it. When he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemies. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Don't take revenge on people who persecute you. Instead, pray for them. That's the kind of moral code that transforms the world. Faith and morality the two supports for the United States of America, without which we cannot survive. We're gonna pick it up again tomorrow as we look at the subject of law. And uh, hey, I just wanna let you know that uh, many of you have been going to the website. Um, I've got, the, I've got the, the, the link at the at the front of my post here. It's uh, kirkcameron.com and you are looking for this monument. Yes, I have them. And as I've said before, this is a very large one. I wanna show you the size of the personal monument. Here it is right here. <clears throat> this is the more manageable size that will fit on your desk. It can fit on your uh, coffee table. Uh, great for homeschooling, for your pastor, for your local elected officials who have public office. They need to understand this stuff, how faith, morality, law, education lead to liberty. And um, I wanted you just to see the size comparison between the large and the small. Right now, I only have the small available. I hope to get the large, uh, but this is what's coming in the mail, is this one right here. Uh, it's 14 inches tall, about eight inches wide, uh, and it's about eight pounds. So it's nice and substantial, and I know you're gonna love it. Um, and I'm so excited for you to get a hold of it so that this these campfires are not just about uh, me warming my backside next to this fire, uh, but that you're bringing these principles into your home and teaching them to your family and to your neighbors. God bless you guys. See you tomorrow night.